side. You're braver than most people. Last time we had every seat full of people around the wall. You never know when you do what to do inside. What to expect. Um, just a couple pieces of uh, information before we start. If anyone didn't get it, we have a legislative report from myself and the two uh, Democratic delegates in, in 3A. And I have a, another smaller one that I use. Uh, this is non political, this is a little more political, but it's still a report on some of the things that, uh, that we've done. Also, if anybody's interested, do we have, we have some of these on the table? Uh, during session, I'm going to be doing some Facebook fan polls. And the list is over there, but it's January 8th, February 5th, March 5th, January 22nd, February and March 19th, April 2nd. So I'll be doing seven Facebooks during the session. And uh, so if you are interested in watch them, you can uh, send in questions or about what's going on. But uh, if you're interested, it's over there to pick up with the dates. Uh, or, um, I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes and then turn it over you, to you to express any feelings you have or ask questions, uh, whatever you want. But uh, you know, I think we're in a crisis in, our, in this country right now. And it's about what our country is and what our values are. And if you can watch what's going on today, it seems like we can't even uh, agree on basic facts. Maybe you've seen the Apple commercial, you can look at it from the left, or you can look at it from the right, it's still an Apple. But uh, we've had a president that's introduced us to uh, fake facts, which I think he accuses the media of. I think he's really the one that, that puts him out. And, you know, one of the real concerns is I think he's trying to undermine democracy. Uh, democracy doesn't work without a free press. And uh, he's trying to marginalize the free press. I don't know. I try. I can't watch Fox News because Fox News, it's just not news. Uh, it's, it's made up. And I see with consolidation uh, about 65% of the radio, uh, radio stations are all going to be controlled by conservatives. So we're not even going to get straight news uh, from them. So uh, you know, we, we've got a, a president, and I'm not running against him, but we got a president that doesn't know how to seem to talk without lying, contradicts himself five minutes after he says something. So it's hard to know uh, what he really thinks. He's claimed to drain the swamp, but instead he's just attacking the hallmarks of, of democracy and bringing in people that one by one by one, uh, you know, there, I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if there's any administ anybody in the administration that hasn't been working with Russia at some point. And you know, Democrats are too nice. We keep saying Russia. I'll guarantee if it was in reverse, they wouldn't be talking about Russia. They'd be talking about communists. I'm sad to say, uh, I think a lot of people in this country aren't well informed when we talk about Russia, probably aren't sure if that's another state, uh, whether it's in one of the states or what it is. But they've all been taught to know that communists are bad. So we should be talking about collusion with communists instead of Russia, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and, you know, taking away, what he's trying to do is take away everything take away or clean air or clean water by putting somebody in charge of EPA that's totally against it. He's taking away our health care. Um, you know, we're talking about tax reform. I'm all for tax reform. 
the tax reform ought to be fair. Uh, it's not. It's all slanted to the rich. And if you just go down the list, it's taking away the idea that climate change is legitimate. 97, 98% of the scientists in the country say it, it's real and the human effect of it is real. We're the one major country in the world now that isn't in on dealing with climate change. You know, what a what an embarrassment to our country. Well, uh, we can't do every, everything about that at the state level, but we certainly are trying to uh, buffer as much as we can what might go on in Washington. But we just had a very successful for the Democrats in the election last week. And very frankly, we've got to carry that on to next year. You know, we've all, too many people have always voted from the top down. We need to flip that and vote from the bottom up. That's where most of the decisions that affect us every day are made. Made in city government, they're made in county government, and they're made in state legislatures. But we don't look at it that way. Next year is really important as far as state legislatures are concerned because we have redistricting coming up in 2020. And if we don't control uh, more of the legislatures around the country, we're going to see redistricting get worse and worse. North Carolina, uh, you know, I'll be honest, we have one congressional seat in Maryland with fair redistricting, we probably wouldn't have. But go to North Carolina in Congress, more Democrats voted for their for a Democratic congressmen than Republicans, and they've got us in seats in North Carolina, two and a half to one. Same thing in Florida. The redistricting is working against us all across the country because They've got control, and they're trying to stop people from voting, and they're trying to control the legislatures that way. Um, we need, it, it's apparent Congress isn't going to do anything, so hopefully the Supreme Court will step in and do something about redistricting, because it needs to be done nationwide, not state by state. And uh, otherwise, I, I find it hard to support it here. I'd like to see it be fair, but I don't want to give up a congressional seat here when the Republican states are taking them away. Uh, it, it just uh, it just doesn't make sense to do that. So we need that to happen uh, nationwide, and we need to get people out to vote. Uh, Larry Hogan in Maryland is really pushing for redistricting in Maryland, but Senator Van Hollen put a bill in Congress asking for nationwide redistricting, and he asked Governor Hogan if he'd sign a letter in support of it, and he wouldn't. It just shows he wants it for Republicans, he doesn't want it for the country. And uh, I know he's very popular, I might offend some people here, but he's not bipartisan, he doesn't work with their side. He governs by putting his finger in the air and voting on what seems to be popular. And he disguises himself going to the left and he goes farther to the right. So uh, he's looking to take over the Maryland Senate this year. If he gets five more senators from the Republican side, we cannot override any of his vetoes. And then you're going to really see the change. Very frankly, I'm his number one target. And if he gets me, the social issues as far as overrides are, are dead because the other Democrats he's going after are in marginal areas and they vote like Republicans. Um, Harry Truman once said, uh, when you have the choice between a Republican and someone who acts like a Republican, the people are going to vote for the Republican. So I think we need to stand up for progressive values. And Democrats in marginal areas would do better if they stood up for progressive values rather than trying to be imitation 
uh, Republicans. Uh, as far as polling is concerned, and we all look at it to some degree, progressive values poll in the 70 percent. Even they poll well with the Republicans, but we haven't messaged them well. And I won't use her language, but I was at a, a seminar with a lady who does nationwide polling, and she said I was a strong Hillary supporter, but that effing Trump knew how to talk to his people. And she said, unfortunately, Democrats are wonks and talk to each other. We haven't done a good job of talking to the people. So she showed that by just, uh, I mean, in, in messaging, we've been losing to the Republicans by about nine points. Just by changing the messaging, we win by nine points. And so there are terms that we need to use, so fair. If you just say, let's tax the rich people, doesn't go over well. But if you say, we need a tax system that's fair and not just fair for the rich people, holds way up here. So the taking away holds really well. And we need to point that out. It's like, um, it's, well, wages haven't risen. Well, it's not that they haven't risen, they've been taken away. Uh, our economy, you look and say, oh, we've created jobs, the stock market's up. It's a great economy for the rich. It's not, it's a terrible economy for the working families. Uh, one of the guys who has filed against me already, and, well, I won't use his name, but he, he owns 15 Burger Kings and he came down and talked to me. He was upset because I was voting to raise the minimum wage to 10 and a quarter. To be very honest, I've raised it to 15. I think anybody that works 40 hours a week ought to make enough to live. And we should talk about livable wages, not minimum wages. If people work 40 hours, I'm not talking about being rich. They ought to at least make enough to pay rent, have a car, send their kids to school, have health care. Uh, and, and we're not doing that in this country. Uh, don't mean to always pick on one company, but the biggest welfare in this country is corporate welfare to companies like Walmart. Uh, the biggest com companies in the country, and they pay rotten wages, and al almost all their employees are on food stamps and housing assistance. While the five owners of that, the four brothers and sister, are multi billionaires and getting richer, and they don't pay their people. Um, so it's something that that you know we need to to take care of. Um, enough of that. I'll jump back to uh, Marilyn and and what I'm doing. I'm trying. I've, I've been putting in more bills in the legislature probably than anybody the last couple of years. I'm cutting back and trying to concentrate on a few ones. Oh, by the way, uh, Billy Shreve, I'll use his name, just announced that he's running for Senate against me. And what did he say? One of the first things he said is, Trump needs a voice in the Maryland legislature. <laughs> now, the other guy, Gio Grande, Gio Grande wants Hogan to have or a voice in the legislature. Well, I'm not there to represent anybody, anybody but my constituents, mostly my constituents here, but my constituents in the state. I'm not there to, to carry anybody else's agenda out. I'm trying to carry one out that's for the people I represent. And I think that's, that's what we all ought to be doing. Um, I have a bill back in this year. Uh, last year, I think I had enough votes for it to pass my committee, but also had to pass finance, and that wasn't going to happen. I have a bill in to, to provide free tuition uh, for vocational tech students and community college students. One, one of the uh, huge problems in this country right now are the kids graduating with astronomical student loans. And I, I know a lot, they basically, as I put it, 
have a mortgage, but they don't have a house. <laughs> <laughs> and they probably aren't going to get a house uh, with what they're carrying. So uh, we need to, to work towards uh, getting our youth through college, uh, getting those that want vocational, uh, you know, certificates. I've talked to a number of builders that said they can't find a plumber and a bricklayer hardly under 55 years old. They're good paying jobs. And everybody isn't going to go to college. Uh, so we need to provide good jobs for, the, for those that can't, and we need to get them uh, the training for those jobs. So if we can uh, provide free certificates, and I'd like to eventually extend it to people, older changing careers out of necessity or because they choose to, uh, to get that too. But we need to help those people. We need to get our kids out of college without having their life mortgaged. So I think this is a good step that those that choose to. Now, basically, it's not only for people whose income is less than 150000 a year. They would, they would get free, free tuition. Um, the reason it didn't pass was we didn't have the funding source. So I have a companion bill in this year for the funding source. Um, it's called combined reporting, except in my bill, I didn't use those words because it's had a negative uh, context in, in Maryland. Combined reporting. Uh, there are companies, I'll go back to Walmart, Kmart, Target, and a lot of others, do business here. And they transfer their profits back to their home state and pay taxes there, and they pay no corporate taxes here. But the little card store next door, or the little women's clothing store, or whatever, they all pay taxes. So again, it's a fairness issue. Everybody says, oh, little businesses are the heart of our economy. But we penalize them and give a free ride to the big corporations. So my bill is strictly on retail and restaurants that have out-of-state headquarters. They pay taxes here. And combined reporting means uh, on the books, they pay taxes on the share of profits they made here. Over 20 states have already done this. Some conservative, some liberal. So it, it's not really a conservative liberal issue in most places. That combined reporting on those companies would produce $50 million in taxes for people doing business here and not paying taxes. We're not charging them new taxes. We're just taking our share of what they make here. And that would let our kids go to community college and put vocational uh, certificates tuition free. So two years that way, and there are other programs and other help, but at least those that choose to stay here uh, would get through the first two years without any debt. I can't emphasize how important I think community colleges are. I can tell you, I would not, I probably would not have a college degree if it had not been for community college. My family was very poor. No one had ever gone to college. My mother raised four of us alone, had no money. I got out of school and I worked as a short order cook, a spot welder in a Safeway grocery store. And I, I got through community college and while I was at Safeway, I worked, went on the night shift. I worked all night, got in my car and drove to College Park. Uh, got married, had two kids along the way. Didn't get my degree until uh, much longer than the four years. You know, it's great for people to get. And then I, I became a teacher. And I had four sons. And I can tell you, putting four sons through college uh, on teacher salaries is not easy. So I laid out a plan for them, what I would do and what they had to do. And if they went to community college, it would, it would save them enough money. I said I'd pay half of what the University of Maryland calls room board tuition books and allowance. The other half was theirs for four years. So if they went to Harvard, that's fine. I was still paying half of Maryland's cost. If they went to the community college, I didn't charge them for room or board during those two years, and they saved up money towards their third 
in the fourth year. So all four of my boys graduated from community college and then he went on and graduated from college with three master's degree and a law degree between. Uh, my one son makes a lot of money, but his three daughters all went to community college. <laughs> they all have bachelor's degrees and one has a master's so far. So uh, community college has been a major, major factor in my family and I know a whole, whole lot of other families. I have a scholarship up at FCC. Uh, I have an art show. I try to have one every year, and I'm overdue. And I donate all the money for my paintings to the scholarship fund. And I have 30,000, I think, in it so far. I hope to get up to 50 or 60. But out at the college every year, they have an event where they invite the people to have scholarships and the people to get them. And I haven't gotten to go to it too many times. But I went there one year, and this little girl about Five, uh, four, eleven, and she couldn't have weighed more than 85 pounds. Came in with her grandmother who raised her, who was the same size, yellow teeth because she ran out every five minutes to smoke a cigarette. But the little girl sat, sat there, the young woman, and um, with tears in her eyes said, I'm the first one that's ever taken a college class. And I love Frederick Union College, and I hope I can find a way to go on. And she thanked me 10 times. And I said, you know, I don't know what's happened to all the other scholarships I had, but that one, it was the only one that made it worth it. So we need to, we need to help our, our kids that way. Uh, real quickly, I have a bill back this year that I put in several years. Uh, I hope one of these years that we get a serious hearing. And that's to phase out state income tax on uh, seniors over 65 that make less than $75,000 a year uh, to make it easier for them to stay and, and live here. I uh, have a bill in and I'm calling slots for homeless veterans. Uh, the veterans clubs all have five slot machines. The fraternal clubs, I like to call them the animal clubs, the elk and the moose and the eagles and whatever, uh, all went five. So I'm putting in a bill that they would get five, but the state share of that money would go uh, to help find uh, housing for homeless veterans. We wouldn't get any of it. I'm sure somebody's going to resent the fact that I'm trying to give money away, new money away, but I, I think it's a uh, worthy cause. <coughs> also, I'm putting a, a bill in. Uh, it's a joint resolution to increase the number of women on corporate boards. Uh, it is just a resolution, it's not a requirement. We tried a bill last year to at least force requirements of companies that did business with the state that have more on the boards. This is just a, a resolution urging it. California did it and it has helped. And interestingly enough, if you look it up, the Fortune 500 companies that have more women on their boards are more profitable than ones that don't. So there's a real good argument. Uh, to do it just for the sake of, of uh, profit. Uh, I have a bill back in this year for Maryland independent filmmakers. When I finished my years as mayor, a reporter asked me what my greatest accomplishment was. He thought I was going to say all of downtown or Carroll Creek or a whole bunch of projects. And I said, my greatest accomplishment was that I have four sons. They all graduated from college and they all came back to Frederick to pursue their careers. And that's what I want for everybody. That if their kids want to come back, they can. And I said, I know some will have to leave. Like if they want to be a, uh, an actor or a director for films, they'll have to go to Hollywood or whatever. Well, we have a burgeoning film industry in Maryland now. And, um, uh, I love Kevin Spacey as an actor, but this has been a horrible week. But, you know, we have been subsidizing the House of Cards to stay in Maryland on tax benefits. And I have enjoyed the show House of Cards. But we have small companies, a bunch here in Frederick and a bunch across the state, 
that are making movies here, that are hiring local actors and actresses, that are spending money here, local directors and, and whatever. And I'm just asking for a fraction of what we've been giving to the big companies to give these companies a break so they can film here. Um, any of you see Blair Witch pro uh, Project? Okay, that was a that was a Maryland film uh, based around Burkittsville. Though I think most of it was actually shot in Montgomery County. Uh, but we have a, a, a lot of people here, and if you if you make the film festival sometimes here, you can see the work that's being done, and it's getting better and better. And that's real jobs here, not helping a Hollywood company. So I'm, I'm going to keep pushing for, pushing for that. Uh, I have a bunch of others, but I, I, they're the major ones this year. I don't know how, but I somehow became uh, chair of the alcohol subcommittee. <laughs> so I deal with a lot of alcohol bills, and I'm really trying to help, and the controller stepped up pushing this. Big companies like Flying Dog, which can go from 100,000 barrels a year to 700,000, but to a bunch of the real little ones that are here in Frederick, as well as the distillers that are coming. It's a, again, local businesses, local jobs, local economy, and you know that's, that's what we ought to be supporting here. So my emphasis is still trying uh, to help on the local alcohol bills as well as the state ones and to bring bond money back. Uh, there's a certain amount we get each year. It's a lot less than it used to be, but uh, we've been able to help a whole whole lot of things like the YMCA, the homeless shelters, uh, the biggest one is uh, infrastructure for the downtown hotel. But over the years, uh, money for Hood College uh, to support local programs and local needs uh, like that, the, the ranch where uh, they're doing drug re rehabilitation. Uh, so we, we still try uh, to do all that. There are usually about 1,100 bills brought into the Senate each year and about 1,500 into the House. Uh, we have four committees in the Senate, and every senator's on one of those committees. I'm on education, health, and environmental affairs. We have just about all the policy issues. We have the three I mentioned in the title. We have military, we have voting, we have alcohol, we have uh, regulations and inspections for funeral homes, all the work trades, uh, on and on and on. So almost half the bills come to my committee. Uh, it's a real job to read all this and try to, you know, know what's going on. <coughs> we have a bit of a trust factor there that if it gets violated, it, it changes. But if a bill comes out of committee overwhelmingly, Usually it passes the floor pretty automatically unless it's some controversial issue that you know something about that you disagree with. But uh, I don't know insurance issues. So if the insurance co committee that does insurance sends something out at 11 oh, I trust that that's a good bill and I vote for it. And the committees more or less trust each other on issues like that because you, you can't know everything about everything. So you have to re rely that way on uh, on them and on staff. And uh, by the way, we have small staff, but I have a terrific staff. Uh, Lara standing there is my uh, chief of staff. And April, uh, oh, she's in the back. <laughs> April is my second employee. And I ha sadly have to say that my wife stole her from me. <laughs> <laughs> She's going over to work in the house uh, uh, for my wife. So uh, I have been so fortunate to have two people like I have that, uh, you know, there are times I've had to. It's times I stop down late in the day and say, go home. Uh, they're that dedicated and, and working. And 
I bring it up for another reason. I just uh, went out to Sam's Club. Well, I, I guess I shopped at Costco. I like their business policy better. But Sam's Club has a coconut water that I drink all the time. And Costco doesn't carry. But as I was coming out, some guy behind me, uh, I said, Senator. And I turned around. He said, I just want to tell you, that I had a real problem with taxes, and your staff was so good. They solved my problem for me. That just happened two hours ago. Mm -hmm. And I've had that happen a lot. Uh, and uh, that's just good constituent work on their part. Sometimes, like the one today, I didn't even know about it. But, uh, he gave my credit to staff and gave me credit for having such a good staff to get things like that done. So that's great. And, and they've been uh, really wonderful. Uh, I have a couple other things I'll say at the end. But basically, I just kind of tried to cover the background. Uh, I'll, give, I'll give a plug. This is absolutely. Well, if I lose, it's my last term now. If I win, the next term is my last term. And uh, I have such good staff. I'm hoping that Lara will run for my seat and win in 2022. Uh, <laughs> she's uh, got a great background. She's smart. She's hardworking. Uh, we need more women. Yes. In the legislature. <laughs> and so I'm supporting her. <laughs> um, let's take some questions or comments. So the National Republican uh, Party seems to have a vendetta against Planned Parenthood. Yes. And they're going to try to defund it. And the question is, what are, what are you doing to make sure that doesn't have bad effects in Maryland? In the last legislative session, we put money in the budget to fund Planned Parenthood if the feds cut it out. It's too valuable to our state and particularly our women. Now, some men use it too, to let him take something like that away. Uh, hopefully, we're going to have the support and resolve in, in Washington that it doesn't get taken away, but he was proposing to do that. But if he does, we're going to cover it and make sure it stays. It's not just him, it's the whole party. It's Ryan and yeah. McConnell and the whole party. Well, it's the whole Republican They're Party, ready. yeah. But we're not going to uh, we're not going to let our women lose the coverages and the help they've got through Planned Parenthood. You know, 1% of what they do is abortion and it's not from federal funds. Yeah. And to make an issue of it, over abortion it's ridiculous but I would we have guaranteed that in Maryland's not going to get hurt by it we'll cover it if they take it away but hopefully that won't happen I first thing I'd like to thank you for all this wonderful work that you're doing uh, I didn't know I'm, I'm a relatively new resident to Frederick you know having moved from Loudoun County to Frederick County over here and I've just been very impressed with your work and, and what you're doing and Nothing you've said I disagree with, you know, so I'm so grateful that we have you representing us down there. So first off, I want to say thank you. Second, I also have four sons, you know, and so I know that story. I also worked full time and went to school part time for 10 years to get my bachelor's degree. So I also know that story. So uh, I'm certainly empathizing with you on what that looks like. And um, so that said, my question is, um, I love these programs that you do. I think they're all meaningful. I, of course, I just retired, by the way, uh, from the CIA. So I can say that now. And all this stuff about Trump, by the way, is it, it has a lot of veracity because I know how the Russians work. And what they claim they've done is, is actually makes really strong sense. But that said, um, this retirement tax, I think, is wonderful, what you're doing, because uh, Maryland has a reputation for having taxes higher, so people tend to go to Virginia versus because their uh, taxes are a bit lower, and I think this is a good idea. The only uh, thing I'm asking about is the environmental stuff. Yes. So, um, 
I just came from two months in Spain, and it's the all the mountains are covered with windmills. So between sixty and seventy percent of their energy uh, comes from windmills. You know, it's just everywhere over there. And uh, so it, this is something the renewable energies thing is something that can be done. So it's not like a pie in the sky sort of thing, or it's too expensive, or this and that. They've been doing it. and Spain is not a rich country. Like no, us. And, and and they're able to do this successfully. Uh, do we have anything in, in the legislature that is looking in that direction towards some sort of renewable energy uh, stuff? Uh, we do. I've talked about that before I want to go. I was saying, yeah, I, I have a 100% voting record on conservation issues and uh, have a real good friend sitting in the back of the room. Roger, stand up. Roger's in the state senate, and I think he's had a hundred percent record on conservation issues every year he's been there. I heard the last name, Manor. Yeah. Oh, believe me, I was going to tell you. <laughs> uh, Roger's running for Congress in this district, All right. and. Uh, <laughs> 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 Do you live in Frederick? No, you know we ha we have some good candidates running. Question. I think he's the best. Um, so uh, yeah. I just want to point him out to say uh, he's a progressive. Uh, we vote a like on most most everything, and he's a great guy. And uh, look him up, remember him, and hopefully you might vote for him. I am. <laughs> but your question, yes, um, we, you know, wind is, this isn't a good county for wind, so it's not a, a viable uh, alternative here, but, you know, we have discussion, and I think it's going to probably pass at some point, maybe this year, to raise the renewable portfolio to 50%, and I support that. Uh, a few years ago, un and unfortunately, well, I'll get to that. Had a guy in town came here was building zero energy houses. Uh, didn't require gas, coal, oil, electricity. Hooked to the grid because on the number of sunny, uh, cloudy days, he had to draw some electricity, but then he paid it back on sunny days. Uh, he built 21 houses. He was building a 53 unit. Uh, house unit. Unfortunately, he should have sold his package and not gotten in the construction business. He, he went under, which probably hurt uh, zero energy houses to a degree, which is a shame. Uh, I showed the former governor how for the money that he was going to spend on offshore wind, we could put one million people in Maryland in zero energy houses where they have no utility bills. I don't know what my utility bills are. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, one of the young ladies who formerly worked for me uh, bought one of those houses and she has a utility bill ranging between five and ten dollars a month. And that's because of fees for being connected to the grid, not because of use. So just imagine what we could do if I'd love to see it one day become the building code in Maryland. Uh, you can build those houses for a reasonable price. Uh, and if you take it out of what you don't have in the utility bill, it means you can pay more on your mortgage. So the small additional cost more than covers itself. But you have to you have to get the builders used to building them. You have to get the banks to understand the financing because they just aren't used to looking at the fact that there won't be a utility bill and they can let you have a, a higher loan. Uh, so, you know, we're working on a, a lot of those things. I tried to get a bill in for $100 million for no interest uh, construction loans. And it's going to take it out of the rainy day fund. And the construction loan lasts six months. So, Every loan that was taken in six months is paid back. They were putting, you know, 
thousands and hopefully a million people in zero energy homes. Mm -hmm. So we need to look at those directions. You know, I go to Europe a lot too, and, mm -hmm. and you see Europe ahead of us. There are several countries that already have building standards like that. Mm -hmm. You know, we ought to be dominating our renewable energy field, and China's ahead of us. Uh, so, yeah, we're supporting those issues in Maryland as much as we can. And uh, I know we're both very much in support of them. Thank you. I have a question. First of all, I want to thank you for providing the interpreting services today. Mm -hmm. Also, I would like to make sure that my vote matters. Can you talk a little bit about the, more about the gerrymandering? Well, it's rather simple. The, the party in power in a particular state draws the lines. I'll take that one back here. Draws the lines as to where the districts will be. And there are places, I think there's one down in Florida, where it just goes down a road and uh, to pick up other voters to make it a, a Republican district. And uh, the only thing the Supreme Court has said about gener gerrymandering in the past is that the districts all have to be the same size population-wise, and they have to try to represent minorities. Uh, actually, that today is creating some of the gerrymandering problems because unlike in the past, in particularly a lot of areas in Maryland, <coughs> one, uh, the minorities have spread out. So in some of the districts, in order to make it a minority district, they have to almost go out and around certain streets or whatever to pick them to pick up enough to make it a minority district. Um, I, I think we ought to have nonpartisan chosen people uh, that the district should be in blocks as much as possible. We should try to keep towns intact within the district. And uh, we would just end up with a, a lot more fair districts. I'm in a district that could go either way. There was a Republican in my district for 36 straight years before me. And frankly, I think if I were not running this year, it would be a Republican back. Um, so I'm you know, hoping that we're seeing a shift and, and we can do that. But actually, that's the way all, every district ought to be. That, Neither party is guaranteed for to win, and it it gets people maybe a little more to the middle and a little more out talking to the people, knowing that if they don't stay in touch, they're going to lose the next time. And that's how <coughs> every district should, as much as possible, should be, but they're not. Uh, they can go into a, a area where you'd have several Democrats and. Divide it in a way that you take little portions out and add other people in, whether it be a Democrat or Republican, to throw the balance off. Uh, I got a question here. It says, do you plan to vote uh, to override Governor Hogan's veto of sick leave? Absolutely. Uh, You know, uh, when we were debating that, people were trying to make such an argument, oh, what diff how difficult it's going to be. What we're saying is, in businesses, you get one hour of sick leave for each 30 hours you work. So everybody uh, already has payroll cards, how many hours people work. So assigning the sick leave is not that difficult. And the most they can earn is five days a year. That's they're required five days a year. So it's a very simple thing, and I don't know, if, you know, if I go into the restaurant and order dinner, I don't want the waitress standing there sneezing over top of my food because she couldn't take the day off because uh, she was sick and couldn't afford to take the day off because she can't pay the bills if she, if she doesn't work or he doesn't work. So, you know, I think it's something to, we should have, and yes, I'm going to vote to override that. Uh, hi, my name's Laura, and uh, I work in a restaurant, um, have for most of my life. 
Um, <clears throat> and actually, I work right around the corner on the board work in this meeting. Um, and I have a follow-up question um, because it's always confused me. And um, when we talk about, it, I love this idea um, because it is a hardship and puts us in a really difficult position to keep a restaurant going, um, you know, and to keep our own lives going. But how is there a way that the state will determine what the remuneration will be for those hours? Because as probably most of you know, the minimum wage is a little under, for, for a tipped restaurant workers, is a little under $4 an hour. Um, so who would be responsible for making up with it? Is like, is there something in the law that says, you know, um, there's going to be an average over your last however many pay periods that will determine the hourly for which you will be paid? Because three, whatever an hour is, it's not gonna that's, be much for a tipped worker. That's a good point, and Roger, we really haven't heard uh, Delegate Karen Lewis Young just came in also in the back. Um, I don't think we addressed that in that bill, did we? We did. It was a floor amendment. A uh, floor amendment. Success. So they're guaranteed uh, what? I think that, I think you were right. It's something like three dollars and something cents an hour. Yes. Uh, so it was a the increase in the minimum wage bill. Our amendment tried to bring tip workers. Up to the yeah, minimum wage. Yeah, that's right. I think it was unsuccessful. Wow. So, as far as the sick leave thing would be concerned, your hour for 30 hours would be worth three, blah, 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 an hour. If you were right. Yeah. What you think? Well, on the minimum wage bill, <coughs> that's what. Oh, that. Right. And address the tip workers specifically mm -hmm. to bring them up to what the minimum wage was. Is it, is another wage for tip workers or something like that? But, her, her question is, if she misses a day's work, is all she gets for three something an hour? Uh, I, I think I think it is. It's not been addressed, and that is that isn't really fair. Good afternoon, Senator. So I had a question about the redistricting uh, in 2020. So I know you mentioned you would like ideally purple districts, not blue districts, two and a half, equally possible. So you noted that that would be. 80 to 20 at any given election. So you had mentioned earlier that you did want to do that in Maryland unless a state like North Carolina or were to do it, they were to do it nationally. And I'll just put the disclaimer as a Republican, I lived in North Carolina when they redistricted the Democrat by <coughs> McIntyre out of his seat. And I didn't like that because he was there for 20 years, people loved him. And if the only way to get rid of somebody is to draw the line to the point that they lose, I don't think it's fair. Now, yesterday I, I went to visit my mother. We she lives in Littlestown, part of the year. So I drove from here to Littlestown. I went to Congressional District 6, came to Congressional District 8, and then Congressional District 1 of Tottenham, which is the same district as the, the Eastern Shore. So even if North Carolina won't come to their sense, even if the Congress won't act, and again, as Republicans, Congress has not shown any propensity to do much of anything, what will Maryland do? Will you stand up and just say, look, it's not right? Wherever it happens, we're going to take a stand here. We're going to lead the way and we're not going to wait for other people. We're just going to make sure that it's as fair as possible that someone's rights to vote to make their voice heard aren't taken away. You know, ideally, I'd like to say yes to that, but I can't in good conscience say yes to it just in Maryland when no Republican state is doing it. Because, there, as I said earlier, Governor Hogan has asked us to do Maryland State redistricting. But when Van Howland asked him for a letter of support for national redistricting, he wouldn't do it. So it shows how political it is. We did pass a bill set showing six states that we would do it there. And those six states together have the same amount of Democrats and the same amount of Republicans. So we would do that as a pack to go to, to that. But uh, I, in all honesty, for political reasons, can't say I want to give away a seat when the other side won't consider giving any back. I hope, like heck, the Supreme Court, there's a couple cases there now, I hope, like heck, that they make us all do it. And then I'd be glad for us to do it. But yes. I think it's just, you know, we say, oh, it's Maryland, but by changing the seats just here, 
we're, set, we're going to Washington and tipping the balance off. And that affects what happens in the whole country. Yeah. So I think we have to deal with the whole country. Julia Schaefer, thanks for being here. Also a new resident. Um, I, have, I have some thoughts, not very well articulated, but they have to do with concern over the lack of voter turnout in general throughout the country, uh, locally, state, national. Uh, I know there are lots of complex reasons for that, lack of trust in institutions, certainly not being bolstered by the president today. Um, so I'm not sure how we resolve that, make that better, but I think we've got, you know, kids in school, K through 12, who need to know what it means, truly understand what it means to be a citizen, what civic education is, what are your responsibilities, what are the benefits, what does it mean to be an American, for God's sake, living in a democracy, and I would hope that uh, we have adequate, uh, I, I don't know what the curriculum is like, but I would you know, put you, ask you to put your teacher hat on and uh, take a look at that and see what we can do to bolster that to raise some informed and active future citizens. I, I don't know if it's still offered. I took problem with democracy in high school. And uh, that was a big help to me, making me more aware. And very frankly, I, I guess I was fortunate. I had teachers along the way. And, uh, I got involved in politics in seventh grade. I was uh, Adelaide Stevenson's campaign manager in my junior high school. <laughs> you weren't very effective. I know. <laughs> it's, it, it's sometimes good to start off with the loss. It makes it you crumble and teaches you. <laughs> and I sure started off with the, with the loss. But I, I agree. We, we have to... Uh, Teach civics more. I, I've had reluctance uh, doing it, but someone had a bill in and said kids should have before they graduate from high school should have to pass the citizens test, the new citizens <laughs> take. And I, I don't know about making that a requirement, but I kind of like it the it's way too. They should easy. know. <laughs> it is. Yeah. I took the I took the test and I, I missed one question. Uh, it was. I forget one of the amendments. What does it do? And I said, well, I know what all the amendments do, but I don't remember the number to every one of them. So I'm, I missed one on the number. But uh, it's not that hard a test. Well, and, I'm going to for sort of a broader, more expansive look at yeah. how we teach uh, citizenship in Maryland public schools, which should be the best schools in the nation. Well, we were number one in the nation for five or straight, six straight years, but now we've slipped. Yeah, from this, this administration. Yes, sir. Uh, three things I'd like to see you keep working on or work on. Uh, first is on the credit reporting companies, Experian, et cetera, to make it no charge for both freezing and unfreezing credit reports. I believe right now it's either it's no charge to one or the other. It should be for both because you've got to go and do both on a regular basis. Uh, number two is your death with dignity or assisted suicide bill. I'd like to see you continue working on that. Maybe we'll get that through. Uh, I think that's very important to get that done. And if somebody doesn't want to, don't do it. But the religious aspect of that should not affect everyone. Uh, number three, uh, legalization of marijuana. After five years, it's time that Maryland stopped dancing around on that. Everybody's just been avoiding the issue. It's time to go to just complete legalization. There are enough examples from Washington to Maine of how to do that. Everybody's just been playing with that in Maryland. And uh, in Nevada, it can go from both to legalization in six months. Maryland can do it after five years. Yeah. Uh, the death of dignity bill, that, that's been a, I know. A, a real frustration to me. I had the votes on the Senate floor to pass it. Couldn't get it out of committee. The committee was. Uh, I don't know why. It's, it should be a nonpartisan issue. Polls show that almost every group supports it, including the majority of Republicans, even the majority of Catholics, so the Catholic Church itself doesn't support it. Uh, but I, six of 11 members on the committee that were just dead set against it. And uh, I think Democrats? Yes. I think it's time to name them, and it's time. <laughs> Maybe we just don't support a Democrat because they're a Democrat, yeah. and not just vote for them automatically. Well, I, I 
Agreed. Uh, I don't know if anybody else is putting a bill in this year. I'm not, and, and the reason is simple. I'm tired. Are no. the committee votes secret? No. Uh, so not secret. Bill. Yeah. Uh, the reason is it's still got to go back to that same committee and they're not going to pass it. So if I'm back next administration, a number of people on that committee will be gone or moving. I'll put it back in then and see if see if we have a chance. But this year to spend the effort to bring all the people in and to know there's no way it's going to pass. Uh, I, I'm just going to wait till the next administration and if I'm there, I'll I'll put it back or I'll make sure somebody does and I'm sure Zach will support it. Um, you know, I, you said what I've said to a lot of people. If you don't like it, don't do it. Uh, I don't know if I'd do it, first of all, but I like the option. And, uh, you know, when that time comes, if I'm in that situation, maybe I'd do it, maybe I, I wouldn't, but I sure like the option. And I think everybody should have that option. My sister passed away summer before last, and I went out to see her. She was in Arizona, and uh, she had cancer and some terrible pain, and she had tears in her eyes, and she said, I sure wish we had it here. And uh, I can't tell you the stories we've heard of, of, of people with that. And uh, I, I think it'll, it'll all be right. So we'll, we will continue that. It just doesn't make sense this year. And uh, legalization of marijuana, I kind of like the path that Oregon and Washington passed, path they took. Uh, I read some things on marijuana and I never even thought about all the problems of just making it legal like that, how it would be controlled and how it would be done. And out there, they started with the legal marijuana. They got the dispensaries, the growers, and the whole process set up. And then it was far easier to go the next step because they had guidelines. And um, They've spent a couple of years trying to get it going here just on the medical part. I don't know what it would probably taken forever if they had full scale. So I think legalization is going to hit most every place in this country within five years. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. So taxable. I just like to have a have the system. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. By the way, I, I visited a dispensary locally, and Greenleaf is growing it. Uh, Doug, Karen uh, Lewis Young, and I visited some facilities out in Washington when we were there. They were good, uh, but compared to what these are here, it was like Walmart and Nordstrom's. Uh, these two dispensary and grower here are first class, and uh, they've got good people on staff. I mean, the dispensary's got a doctor and a psychologist, and uh, they're making sure that being taken and used for the right reasons and whatever. But uh, I think the legalization is coming. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Murray. Uh, now, I also just moved here uh, from Texas last January. I'm the mother of two children. I'm a registered voter as well. And when I looked at the website for the Frederick uh, County website, government's website, and I learned about you, um, and I learned that you had town halls ever so often, and that they also would be videotaped and on the local access uh, television station. Um, okay. Number one, I didn't know if there was an interpreter, um, because the website doesn't mention that. <laughs> um, also, I wasn't able to go to your curl meeting because it was at 4.30 and I had my kids with me and I didn't want to bring them to a government meeting like this. They would be very restless. <laughs> so, so I did watch it um, on TV and your, your, uh, the program was not captioned and I was really surprised by that. <laughs> I couldn't access that information at all. I couldn't 
you know, participate in those discussions at all. I couldn't, you know, I was just very disappointed that I was not able to access that information at all. So I would strongly encourage you to have uh, your council meetings uh, captioned. And also to have them on the website so that any deaf person can watch those archived uh, programs with well, captions. We'll, we'll pass that on to the city and county. I mean, they do their meetings. Uh, I would assume they have the staff to be able to do that. We'll, we'll look into it and see what we can do. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay. That's yeah. my only request. One of my big concerns uh, is the pending likelihood of uh, reciprocity of uh, carrying handguns. Uh, can you see uh, a state uh, uh, suing in order to get that in the court system? Because I think it would be overturned. Well, I think the only way it's going to happen is if the court orders this. We're not going to pass that. Well, but it, it's very high up in the House of Representatives already. Um, I don't know if they can override our local decision on that. Well, no, this would be a, a nationally mandated at the lowest level. I would have to have somebody look at that constitutionally. Okay. We don't want it happening in Maryland. Right, no, we don't. And I don't know if they can override our that, that's okay. desire yeah. on that. That's, that's right. something we'd have to check. Go ahead. Yeah. Can you, um, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Um, it's bring up such a complicated issue. Um, but, uh, you know, health insurance premiums recently came out and it was through the roof. Um, could you talk in particular about folks whose employers do not, are not required to and do not offer access to a plan to, for themselves? Those folks are just being thrown to the wolves. Mm -hmm. And why is it that someone with a family of four who's been thrown to the wolves is is not priced the same way that family would be if their employer offered it? It's just outrageous. And uh, you've got people paying more for health insurance premiums than mortgages. Mm -hmm. You've got people going into 401ks to pay for health insurance premiums. Well, um, taking their kids off their plans because it's cheaper to get them on a policy through their school or through college. I'll, I'll touch that a little bit and ask Michelle if she wants to add anything to it. Uh, I was telling you the breadth of what we have, and health is one of them. We don't have a health policy. Uh, that is her committee in the House. But first off, it's part of the president's strategy to make the rates go up and then claim that Obamacare failed. And that's what, what he's doing in terms of uh, uh, some of the things that are going on now. And the, the companies, there's a law that they have to be able to make a profit because the healthcare companies here right now said that if they stayed with the rates, they'd go bankrupt. And part of it's based on the unexpected see of what's going to occur. And so they're raising the rates for protection so they don't go bankrupt and they're going to probably continue to go up. And, and like I said, that's his strategy. He wants to bankrupt uh, Obamacare or Affordable, the Affordable Care Act. He'll bankrupt uh, families to do it. Yeah. And doesn't seem to care who, who it hurts in doing it. It was ironic when the House passed the bill they did, and he had the big celebration at the White House. I don't think he knew that it had to pass the Senate too. <laughs> uh, but that very night, he said to the Prime Minister of Australia, "You have the best health care in the world." And you know, they—I'm not an expert enough to say they do, but I do know if it isn't the best, it's one of the best. And everybody has universal health care. I had an intern work for me from Australia a number of years back. And when she left, she said, I really love the three years my husband and I spent here in the United States. And I would never say anything bad about it, but she said he had Blue Cross Blue Shield out at Fort Detrick where 
she was working, and she said, Air Health Insurance insurance in Australia is better than Blue Cross Blue Shield. And the national cost of it, insuring everybody, is half of what we're spending. So if Trump really felt that's the best, why didn't he say, just let's copy Australia? Yeah. Uh, that wasn't his goal. Was to no, I, I think his goal was just to sign something. But under the Equal Protection Clause in the Constitution, shouldn't we all have the same health insurance that members of Congress have? <laughs> yeah. Ted, Ted Kennedy, Kennedy proposed that several years. He said everybody should have what we have. Yeah. How, how can he said to the Senate, how can you justify having it if they can't? So whatever the program is, I think we're the only industrial country in the world that doesn't have universal health care. Yeah, right. No, New Guinea does. New Guinea does. <laughs> You know, my niece and nephew both work here in restaurants, and they both their their insurance uh, tripled, went from yeah. three hundred and something a month to nine hundred and something a month, and they had to drop it because they can't afford it. These are people been working here at yeah. private restaurants for twenty five years. Okay, so they have a family, and they're if they're done, and you've been paying but into it all these years. All these years. Yeah, all of a sudden you have well. I believe in capitalism, but there's three things. Somebody called me a socialist. If they want to call me a socialist for these three things, they can. I think we should have universal health care. First rate public education Amen. and social security. And, you know, they should be worked on to make reasonable and, and Whatever, but there, there are three things that I think every American should have. And go to capitalism after that. Hopefully, uh, hopefully there's a way we can save the Affordable Care Act. Or I, I, don't even care. I, I know it's got flaws. Just come up with something better, not something worse. I have peti oh, two sorry. petitions. They're the same. Uh, and asking for health care for all, universal health care, to go to our two senators to get them behind the bill for uh, Medicare for all. So if you'd like to sign this, I'm going to circulate it. All right. Well done. Thank you. Oh, this is going back to the one that um, Thomas made. So the, the um, retired persons reduced tax. Is there any template? Is there a state that can get the model after? Oh, there are states that have no uh, state uh, tax on the income at all. So everybody, and some are for retired people. So, yeah, my, my bill is for over 65, and because of the cost, I phased, phased it in. But it's just on uh, incomes less than $75,000. They phase out the state income tax. Is it if you make less than seventy-five thousand, you pay none, or is it the first seventy-five thousand you pay none? I originally had to bill in the first seventy-five thousand. Uh, as it is right now, it's just under seventy-five. Uh, there are times when you look back and say, "I'm not going to get this through," so let's get the first step and then you know go from there. So that's what I'm trying right now. Can you explain that further? Yeah. I, I, I yeah. Like everybody, I mean, is it if somebody makes eighty thousand, are they fully taxed? And if they make seventy-four, they're not taxed at all. That's a really important distinction. Yes, under this bill, it is. Under the under the previous bill, uh, it was first seventy-five thousand, not taxed. And I would like to get back to that, but I'm just trying to get the first part through now. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Go ahead. Great. Hi. I'm Bridget. Forget it. I grew up here in Frederick. And then I went to the Maryland School for the Deaf. When I moved away to California, I lived there for almost two decades. Just recently, I have returned to Frederick to live near my dad who's sitting behind me. Anyway, 
I am really enjoying this town hall because of a few reasons right now. Somebody earlier mentioned wanting to support students having a good curriculum in civics and incorporating the government part. I remember in my high school days, we I was involved with state mock uh, legislatures, and I don't know if Maryland still has a program like that. That is something that helped me become quite active in the legislative process than in even California when I was there. So I have to thank the folks who created that curricula. Also, in Australia, people are required to vote. And they have to go to the polling place. They don't have to cast a vote. But by law, you are required to report to your polling station. And I think that's fabulous. I have four children as well, not all boys. Three boys, one girl. And my two adult sons are not registered to vote. I am involved with civics constantly at all levels, but even my own two millennials seem to be uninterested because they feel their votes don't matter. And maybe it's part of the age and what's happening these days, but I would do anything to support the idea of students learning about civics. Now, I would like to go to another issue, and maybe, Senator Young, you can help us with this. The deaf community has a group right now that is looking for language, uh, looking at language for all. Not all deaf babies have access to sign language or any language. Hearing babies uh, have it from the moment of birth. It's taken for granted. They are exposed to language regardless what socioeconomic level they are, what culture they come from. They are exposed and have language. Many deaf babies do not have this same thing, and so they are language starved. What would be your advice for our group? What can we do to prevent any more deaf babies suffering from language starvation in the state of Maryland? Well, the first thing I would say is work through the school for the deaf. Uh, the superintendent comes down every year. Uh, you know, when he has something he thinks needs to be done, he brings it. I have had teachers and parents come to us, and we listen and see if if we can help. Um, I think there's support there. Uh, we're not experts in it, so uh, we listen to people that know and try to uh, help where we can um, you know sometimes it becomes a monetary issue but uh, even then we still try so uh, I would say you know take it to the school uh, take it to I, I think there are groups uh, of deaf parents or parents with deaf children that meet uh, so, if there's a need there, you see, uh, Lara has been working with a, a group uh, for the last several months. Yeah. Uh, she found that some of the issues uh, they were asking for. Do you know for, the name of that organization? It wasn't a specific organization. We were working with constituents. And in fact, we're going to be working with Senator Crossfire on putting the board for a group to look into the issue. So are you saying that if the superintendent of the school approached you and said, we would like for you to submit a bill to take care of language deprivation, is this something you would do? Yeah, we work with the superintendent every year. Uh, this superintendent and the one before him going back. Senator, last, in 2017, you did put a bill in late in session that addressed some of these issues. Um, yeah. It, it came out unfavorably out of the committee, so we've been working during the interim to identify why that was an issue and how it can be improved, and that's when we came up with the bill with Senator Fosmeyer. We'll probably take the lead on it to get a better understanding of what the issue is and how, where the 
current agencies and programs are failing where they're succeeding in addressing children and getting them those services as soon as possible so they don't have the deprivation of the Over the years. And the name of this um, other senator you were mentioning, Klaus Klaus Meyer. Over the years, a high percentage of the bills I put in are brought to me by citizens in the community. Uh, they, they come in with a, a problem and if it requires a bill to address it, we've tried to, to put it in and see it through and we've gotten many, many through over the years. Alan? From here, um, under orders from headquarters, my wife, uh, Sharon Thuris, is a, uh, would like to attend here, but she's doing a presentation Tuesday night at the college with the Coalition for the Homeless Annual Forum. Uh, she's uh, part of her expertise is housing, but a sleeping issue that uh, she's trying to address right now are short term stays. They're uh, on the West Coast. They're, they're a big issue in, in almost every city because they cause addiction, they push people out, people can make a lot more money. And here in Frederick, uh, they are not um, being regulated at the, at the moment. So that's her purpose. Anyway, that's why she can't be here, but she, had, uh, she ordered me to. <laughs> well, I said early on, I do have a, a bill in for. Uh, helping homeless veterans this year. That's just one piece of the problem. But there are a lot of groups working on it. Uh, they haven't come forward with legislation. We're open to that if, if they do. Of course, a big problem is the funding. So this is about Airbnbs um, because you can make $400 a night here in Frederick and they're not regulated and they're not like you're not paying taxes. And, and it's a sleeping problem, but it's an issue that probably needs to be addressed statewide. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so then, do you have um, any uh, idea of the trust bank is going to come up again? Uh, I would assume it will, yes. And uh, I've gotten a, a chuckle. They've already put things out that uh, uh, I'm trying to support. You know, gangs staying here and whatever. And the, the Trust Act simply says that somebody, and, and the courts have already said this, it's a reaffirmation of that, that people just can't be stopped for no reason and that they have uh, rights when they are stopped that they just can't be picked up and, and taken in and shipped out for, for no reason at all. Uh, you know, I. I've said I have absolutely no problem for somebody to com commit an illegal person here that commits a very serious crime. I think they should be tried, do their jail sentence, and then shipped out. Uh, I don't think we should ship them straight out because we found they come straight back. But uh, for the rest of the population, and I voted for the Maryland Dream Act, uh, we have. Uh, this has been a country of immigration. If you look back through history, uh, whatever wave was what came next, people fought it. Uh, signs years ago, Irish need not apply. Italians were, you know, what, what, whatever the group. Uh, I've seen some, or listened to some talks and seen some things that, that most of the people that came here Illegally, as it's described, first off, a wall wouldn't have stopped. They flew in illegally and stayed. Uh, but they're here. One, the cost and the common sense of trying to ship 11 million people out, it's crazy. Secondly, most of them are hardworking. Many of them are doing jobs that other people wouldn't do and that we need done. So, yeah, we need to set up some guidelines, but there ought to be a path to citizenship for them. If they stay here, if they pay taxes. Uh, <laughs> let's face it, unless you're an American Indian, your family came here. <laughs> and, no, they came here too. They came here probably a long time before that. But, 
Uh, I think you promoted a book, uh, talked about how we express our values. Yeah. And when we use the term illegal, that immediately puts a negative connotation yes, on people who cross the border because they have no other way of getting over here because they can't go through the proper paperwork. And so if we change our language to undocumented or unauthorized, yeah. it's and also to avoid the word alien and call them immigrants. Now we're making a little more headway on that language, but I just, uh, is there anything that can be done at a state level to uh, <laughs> encourage a different language? Well, there's a, other language being suggested, but we could change it, but the people that are against it aren't going to change it. Right. And uh, But we pick it up, we get into it. Yeah, but we, what we just need to do is develop a sensible path for work visas for path to citizenship and whatever and then we probably should have uh, more defined regulations on how you come here in the first place but not to exclude I think he just came out with the thing that you had to speak English <laughs> so many people came here not speaking English even when they were going in first and second grade and went on to become doctors and lawyers and head up Fortune 500 companies. I think something like half of all the Fortune 500 companies, the CEOs are first or second generation immigrants. So, you know, there are people come here for opportunity, work hard, have contributed a lot to the country and uh, shutting it down. It, it's part of what has made America great. So we, we need to stop making it the kind of issue it is and work with it. Somebody made a movie about, I lose track of time, years ago, about what America would be like if we got up tomorrow and there were no Hispanics here. So the, the, the hotels were shut down, the restaurants were all closed, there was no produce in the market, construction stopped. Yards were overgrown. It got down to the last one, which I love. It said all the actors and the actresses in Hollywood had to raise their own kids. <laughs> <laughs> so they've been a valuable cut, uh, contributors, and yeah, we have a few bad ones in them. But every everybody doesn't belong to a gang. Most of them don't. They're hardworking people. Uh, sadly, when we were voting on the Dream Act. Uh, I, I had hesitancy at first, and I had eight kids set in my office that all graduated with 4.0 or higher averages, all brought here when they were kids. I'm sure they were selected, but with eight really smart kids that all wanted to go to college. And I thought, what a crazy thing that, that we're making it difficult for them to do that. And uh, I stood up on the Senate floor and said, you know, if we don't let them go to college, one of three things is going to happen. They're going to find a way to get on the the uh, roles for social programs, or they're going to work under the table, or they're going to join a gang. And frankly, one of the, one of the Republicans said, "Well, then put them in jail." I said, "You know, one year in jail costs more than let them go to college. Does that really make sense? I mean, it does." So, uh, yeah. California, and I think several other states have gone to a system in which you don't have party primaries, you have a primary for each office. And, and anybody who wants to run for senator is, is a candidate, and the top two go on to the general election. Where, where do you stand on that sort of system? Actually, most of the systems I've seen proposed I don't like. I do like that one. It could be two Democrats, it could be two Republicans, just the top two vote getters go on if it's for a single office. I, I think there's some va value in that. I'm not for open primaries. Because open primaries, I am in that way I am. Yes, okay. But I'm not for, okay, say it's totally just an open primary. I'm running for re election. And somebody's running against me and I'm saying, oh, he might beat me. And I don't have a primary. So I go get some joker to file in the other party and then I tell all the Democrats to go over and vote for the joker so that the good candidate can't run against me. And it could happen the other way around too. 
And I, I don't like being able to play that kind of game. But I, I, have, I like that system that the top two go on. And that way everybody could vote. And, and it eliminates game play. Could we go back to sort of the beginning? I mean, we need to have a gubernatorial candidate next year yeah. that will bring out the vote and win, right? I mean, isn't that sort of part of the practical politics in which you have to work? That you've got a Republican governor who pretends a lot that he's doing one thing and does another, and what he does is harmful, but it's dressed up in a jolly, health a well met kind of face or something. So how do we do this? And do you have, I hear you have a candidate for the congressional district. So I'd like somebody who lived in Frederick, unless you're going to tell me that only a Republican can win in Frederick. And that brings me to a side question, which is, what is the politics of Frederick City and County? I mean, is it Democratic or is it Republican? <laughs> Frederick City's Democratic, Frederick County's Republican. Okay. So I'm a Democrat and I've survived here a long time. I, I was going to say, I, I mean, um, but what do you have any practical suggestions? We've got a number of candidates who are announced already for governor. You're talking about being progressive. You know, can, I can identify at least one of the announced candidates as progressive. Do you see more of them? Do you see? Oh, se several of them are progressive. And I don't. I don't think we have a candidate right now that's out in front of the pack that I can say that's. Sorry, we don't have one. We don't have one that's out front that I can say that's who's going to win. I that, don't know who's going to win. That isn't what I'm asking now, but first, so that we have one that has our values and we'll have our backs. There are several that have our backs. Okay, but you were talking before we started about how the last candidate just wasn't a good campaigner. I mean, and lost a race he shouldn't have won, even though he was a good guy, right? So yep. the record of accomplishment. He had he had a good background, a good record. He was a terrible candidate. So is there some practical advice? You know, it goes along with getting everybody to vote till we get the good old Australian system of um, everybody at least has to show up at the polling place. But but what should we be looking to do between now and the next race? Not to mention get people out to vote. Get people out to vote. Uh, one, almost one million Democrats in the last state election that were voters <coughs> did not vote. So are you Eight, talking about the state of Maryland? State of Maryland. 18,000 in my district voted in the presidential, didn't vote in the last state. And that's something I touched on in the beginning. We really need to work from the bottom up. People come out, they get excited over the presidential election, and then they ignored the local elections and the state elections, where a lot of the day-to-day -day things that affect them take place, and where they even determine how the presidential candidate is going to be selected. So we just, it's part of civics, we just have to encourage people. I've spoken at a number of rallies, a couple of people told me I shouldn't do it, but I look at it, why all not? these people that came out to a rally, and that's great. It, I think something's starting to build, and I hope it keeps building. But at the end, I said, you know, as I look at this crowd, I know half of you didn't vote. And as much as it is nice for you to come out and protest, if you don't vote, you're not going to win. Don't so, we see signs of something that just happened in Virginia last week that maybe they could be built on elsewhere? We had signs and we had a great turnout on our side here in Frederick. So there's a group here in, in, in Frederick County, Frederick County Progressives. They're very involved. There's you several know. groups like that. There's yeah, very involved. And there's the Maryland State Progressive, which is they're part of that whole thing. So and there's, there's a, the resistance movement and several others. Yeah, there's people out there doing stuff. So you need to look into that. I mean, I'm, I'm a member of the Frederick County Progressives. And they're out there doing, you know, uh, demonstrating, going to Congress and going to the State House, et cetera. They're very involved. But I'm thinking here's a, pra here's a practical lesson from neighboring state, neighboring week. I mean, is somebody doing an analysis to see whether there's anything that could be practiced in Maryland? That, that it, can, it did I, happen. Whether the turnout came It did happen. 
and in Maryland and Frederick and in Annapolis. Both very large turnouts there. Well, the turnout is low and it's very low. It was relatively high. But the turnout the turnout was but our people turned out much higher. Well, yeah. But the turn so so what you would say was what we call election presidential here, election just was the turnout. And the old canard, well, it gets more attention. It's an off yeah. election, but when you're getting a 20% turnout, that's a bogus argument. I would like to see city elections move to the presidential election. Yeah, and state. Uh, no, I I think you need two different ones there. And uh, you know, and con and the Senate gets elected every six years, so they get an off year too. Yeah. But I, I think city elections. Be yeah, advantageous to move to the presidential election. I don't think that we'd get that lost here. Yeah, it gets lost anyhow. Look at the turnout. Hey, if, uh, I'm right. hey, I'm John Kramer. I'm on the uh, Democratic Central Committee. And since we're talking about things like voter turnout and everything, uh, the Central Committee needs volunteers. So if you're interested in volunteering with the Central Committee and helping us to increase voter turnout and help us with our messaging, uh, we have a messaging uh, subcommittee. Everything, we need volunteers. Please talk to me. I'll get you in touch with What's your you. URL? Oh, here I can name my card. Oh, that would be great. Frederick, uh, uh, Frederick Dem uh, Yeah, FrederickDemocrats.org is our website. And there's a link where you can uh, sign up to volunteer with us. FrederickDemocrats.org. Also, uh, there, as I said, there were 18,000 Democrats in my district. and. Delegate uh, Lewis Young's districts, two thirds of mine, that did not vote in the last election. I'd like to get 260 volunteers that would take 50 people, and we're going to contact them otherwise, but contact 50 people and ask them and urge them to come out and vote. So if any of you'd like to do that, we'll have a sign up sheet outside. Okay. But uh, 260 doesn't sound like a lot. But it is a lot to get that many people to do it, and a number of groups have said they would help. You call 100, it's only 130. Oh, anybody that's willing to do 100 too, then I need one less person. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to get that and, and get that kind of turnout, and that would at least make a. Uh, you know, we've talked about progressives. How many of you actually know what a progressive is? How do you get something done? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I'm just not going back. Just for information, because uh, I know people even in my party say, oh, don't say you're a progressive. Well, as, as I said early on, in polls, and polls aren't everything, 70% of the people like progressive values when they're told what they are. So let me just run down a few. First, first off, there are certain words we should use in terms of uh, uh, messaging that go over well in their uh, freedom, fairness, opportunity. And I mentioned talking about don't take things away, but progressive values. Progressive stand for decent wages and benefits for working Americans. We talked about the livable wage, sick leave or whatever. Progressives stand for affordable, high quality health care for all. Progressives stand for public education that's the best in the world, and that's to put everything we can into good public education. Progressives stand for clean, safe, a clean, safe environment, environmental issues. Progressives stand for the elimination of discrimination, which sadly is still existing. Progressives stand for security for the most vulnerable Americans, and that's security not just safety, but security in, in terms of housing and health care and other, other items that they feel they've got a life and can depend on, on things there. Uh, security for protection of privacy. And that goes to a lot of issues, but one uh, controversial one, but things like uh, abortion. It should be your choice. A lot of things, death with dignity, should be your choice. And it should be a private thing. It's your, your life, your religion. So we support privacy. Uh, progressive stand for criminal justice system uh, that focuses 
on uh, helping people and getting people out of the system rather than just on retribution. We have the highest percentage of people in prison in the world, in this country. And most of them go there and just learn more bad things to come out and do that. Uh, yeah, we have to lock up some people because of what they've done, but most, we, we need programs to help them and get them back into the workforce to do things like that, not just lock them up. We've made a lot of our, our jails are private now. They promote putting more people in jail. That's how they make their money. That's costly to everybody. Uh, protection of a, a fair system where everyone pays their fair share of, of taxes. Uh, and again, that's not just the rich getting the benefit. It's a fair share for everybody. And progressives stand for inclusive open government. So there are just a, do, almost a dozen things. That's what a progressive is. And I don't know, I buy every one of those. And uh, I think most people support most of the, those items. So we, we shouldn't shy away from them. And a lot of Democrats do that. It's like, like I said early on, if I have my choice between for most people, if you have a choice, if you're going to vote for a Republican, why vote for a Democrat that acts like a Republican? Vote for the Republican. So if you're going to be a Democrat, stand for the things that we stand for. Uh, uh, Roger, do you like saying the group? Appreciate you coming up there. Well, um, what I, what I would like to say is, uh, if you all don't know how lucky you are to be represented by Ron Young, uh, I sit probably 10 feet away from him. Uh, you get to know who somebody is um, when you're in close quarters for 90 calendar days in a room without windows. <laughs> That's the state senate. Uh, Ron is uh, just tireless, uh, patriot for, for Frederick. And, um, and I'm not just saying that because we're friends, I mean, I admire him. Uh, because of his just what, what he's done for, for this great city and this county. And uh, I, uh, I look up to him because you know, he, he's done so many great things uh, in the city and in the county. So I think, um, I think you're, very, um, you're very well served and uh, I'm uh, so fortunate to have benefited to uh, sit very close to you and to watch your career and to, in many ways. Uh, a model of my own after that for yours in terms of just how you go about doing things in life. Well, Roger, I, 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 thank you. I really appreciate that. And I gave you a plug earlier, but give yourself a quick plug. <laughs> Please vote for me. This is my question. Ma'am, you mentioned before having somebody from Frederick represent you. Um, for those who, who are not familiar with it, this very odd district, it runs from Potomac in Montgomery County, it zigzags over to Aspen Hill. In my district, I represent central Montgomery County, runs up 270, scoops out the city of Frederick, not so much rural Frederick, but the city of Frederick, and then it goes west from there, captures all of Washington County, all of Allegheny County, all of Garrett County, runs to Deep Creek Lake, the Pennsylvania, West Virginia panhandle, uh, it's an enormous piece of uh, uh, geography. Uh, it's very, very diverse, and uh, but it's it, it's it's a marginally democratic district by maybe four percentage points. So, um, and fifty percent of the democratic votes actually are in Montgomery County. But the problem was that was designed was a member of the House of Delegates or the Senate. It was designed for a gentleman that John Delaney beat. Yeah. So, you know, this is no accident, comrade, but we no. end up having no Frederick representative. Well, that's I mean, a lot like the old. Sorry, Beverly but I mean, I give you credit because you show up for Frederick meetings. I think this is not the first time. Well, just let me tell you something about the district that people forget because a decade passed and memories go. But Montgomery County, a large portion of Montgomery County was always in this district. The only time it wasn't was the 10 year period where when they did the redistricting, they said, well, we can't beat Roscoe, so let's just give him all these 
Republicans, it's gerrymandering again, because we can't beat him anyhow. So when they put Montgomery County back in Frederick, for a century, part of Montgomery County has always been in Frederick County. So it's not unusual. District 6. Just to be safe. Yeah. yeah. It's not that. It's just a, what has John Delaney done for Frederick? A lot. Well, actually, a lot, but uh, we, I'm not going to go into that. Does, does he? Uh, let me, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, not to embarrass Roger, but just let me give you one minute about it. Uh, Roger's granddad what, helped form, or form the Garments Union in New York City. Uh, his dad died because of lack of health care. Had, had health problems and had no health insurance and couldn't get what he needed and died when Roger was very young. And his mother, uh, you know, inequality is bad today. It was worse a long time ago. And his mother couldn't uh, hold on to things. And Roger ended up in the orphanage. Mm. And anyhow, to jump forward, he's uh, done a lot for himself, uh, got his law degree, he's, he's in the Senate, uh, and uh, he worked on Capitol Hill for a number of years, and he's been a leader in working on health care issues and, and in uh, working towards everybody having health insurance. Early on, he was involved in that sports supports that it's still a major issue of his. There are a whole lot of other things about him, but I just wanted he to He showed up you. for this meeting. And he showed up for this meeting. And I don't think it's the first time he's been in Frederick either for one meeting like this, because you look familiar, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that, that counts. He's been up quite a bit. I, I appreciate that. I'm Thank glad you. to know that. Thank you. Thanks, Could, Roger. When you talk about Democrats who act like Republicans, okay, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. No. No, go ahead. There's one thing that puzzles me that every time the argument gets made, um, it's about this hotel complex. And I don't see, you know, it's always, well, it'll bring lots of jobs. Well, I hear Republicans saying that all the time. Can you please tell me why Democrats in Frederick are so hot for this? Okay. Uh, you know, my own background, I don't want to go into that real heavy, but I was in America for 16 years. It was a dead, dying town. And we really worked at bringing it back, and it's constantly winning all kind of awards for how great the town is. Uh, we had to deal with a lot of controversial issues. I said, when you lose an election, there's a lot of reasons, but Carroll Creek was one of them when I lost. Uh, people didn't believe in it. But right from the beginning, our plans on Carroll Creek were to have economic development along it, housing, jobs, hotels, things to bring people into Frederick. Tourism in Frederick, a uh, million dollars a day is brought into Frederick County, over a million now from tourism. Uh, one of the things that every good city really needs is a hotel downtown. And almost every downtown hotel in the country with a conference center has been a public-private partnership because the cost of building a downtown are much higher but it's needed. So we've supported it because it supports downtown. One of the things I heard over the years when I was doing all these things was, oh, you're building a parking garage. Instead of that, why don't you give a raise to the police? What people don't understand is with the parking facilities and the businesses we brought in, that generated the income that you could give the raise to the police. If I just gave them the money from the parking deck, in one year it's gone, and the next year, how do we do it again? And everything's still dead. So all, all this are putting pieces of a puzzle together to make a vibrant city that creates jobs that people want to come to. Uh, downtown is one of the major reasons that a lot of people even moved here. They come here for dinner. They come here to tour. Uh, you need a downtown hotel. We've got about 80 biotech firms in Frederick now. They want to bring national and international conferences here. We don't have a place to handle it. They want one where the people can have their meetings and walk out, and walk down the creek, go to restaurants and shops. It just adds something 
the community. I think when we get this one within five years, the second one will come in on the road. Okay. Uh, I've read one report that said that the post office was going to go. And to me, the post office is an anchor. The main post office in Frederick is an anchor to the city. Well, we fought very hard to keep the post office downtown way back when I was mayor 40 years ago. Today, other than the postal office, most of what goes on there could just as well go on someplace else. I don't agree. And I mean, not if you take already. away the physical facility for people to come and use the post office. I, I just said we wouldn't take that away. What goes on in the back of the post office doesn't need to be down here. So uh, the post office isn't going to go away. Uh, they're not going to give it up. But part of the property could be better used sometime in the future. But yeah, we'd still keep the retail post office down there. With its parking lot? With some of the parking lot. They don't need all the parking lot they have. The one over here, but they got a big one across the street, a big one on the side. They don't really need that for the retail. The I'm talking no. about the post no. office parking lot. That When I go there... There are all three it. parking lots. Okay, the, the one next to it, for you to go in to go to, of course, that would stay. Uh, all right. Um, <clears throat> you almost never can find a clothesline in anybody's backyard, no matter how much environmentalists they claim to be. And that, if you took up how much energy would be saved by everybody using clotheslines, that's huge. Um, but my main issue here, you might be able to do something about it. you can't order people to have clotheslines, <laughs> is um, in some states, Vermont or somewhere, they pass laws that you can't have local ordinances or communities or whatever that outlaw clotheslines and, and pro-environmental stuff in the backyard. Most and, people here can if they want. Uh, yeah. And in Frederick County is, is pretty good about that, but over like in Anne Arundel County and Montgomery County, some of the uh, draconian laws with the so-called compliance officers, yeah. it's usually a nasty neighbor. It's usually a neighbor doesn't like you and you've got to cut your grass or, which is not bad for the environment having long grass or I, I, over there, I don't think it's someplace, maybe you can spray pesticides to get rid of dandelions or something, or cut your trees. And I think it's unconstitutional. Somebody can take it to the Supreme Court because it's just one organization playing all three parts of the government. But they have these fines like $1,000 a day if yeah. you don't comply with it, which a poor person could not possibly afford. It's just horrible thing. Well, I don't think we have anything like that here. I hope no, no, Frederick, Frederick is nice, but I'm thinking yeah. of state. I'd like to outlaw this state, state, state so. to get into it with these counties because, I mean, it's like I say, $1,000 a day. It's, I mean, if you're rich, you can afford that, and they can't afford a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I would like to take some of this stuff to court, but I can't afford yeah, to get a lawyer and go to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Well, don't, I don't want to put her on the spot, but Delegate Lewis Young is here. If, You'd like to talk about anything you're doing or say something? Go. Can't hear you. Okay, I do want. Can you come up front? Well, I'm going to be just as loud back there as I'm going to be okay. up here. Why don't you have a mic? People back here. I can't hear better. Back here. Okay. Let me talk about the hotel first. Because I'm a numbers person. Uh, what will a hotel do for Frederick? It will be the greatest economic catalyst we've seen in this, not just in the city, in the county, in the region for decades. Two and a half million dollars in incremental local tax revenue a year, 25 million in incremental economic development. 400 jobs. The area of the city that should grow next is East Frederick. It will be a bridge to East Frederick and a catalyst uh, for, for growth on the east side of town. So that's why your Democrats support it because if you're not growing, you're probably going to die. And we're we're planning for the future. <laughs> also, for over a decade, the major employers in Frederick have said, 
If you want to keep us here, if you want us to expand and hire more people, we need a conference center here. We need a professional venue where we can have conferences, where we can bring in people from out of town. So we are responding to the major employers. When the airport Once is an hour away, if not two or three, what is a convention center going to do? Okay, let me um, talk about center. the convention center is going to draw from from two hours away. Wait a minute. Um, but then we're having a conference center, not a convention center. A conference center, which means it's going to have smaller. But it's not going to make the airport the any closer. Center is when you're having uh, like two thousand people or more. Let me switch to healthcare. Um, one of the reasons that the uh, costs went up so dramatically recently is because of the uncertainty in the marketplace. These insurance companies were saying, what's going on with the Affordable Care Act? What's going to be cut? Is there going to be one? They didn't want to wait and see what was going to happen. They wanted to get ahead of the game. So the increases you're all seeing was anticipation of what was going to happen. Now, for the private market, we have in Maryland um, the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange, which you can go to to either get insurance if you're not covered or if you are covered to make sure you've got the policy that best meets your need at what you can afford. Now, one of the things the Trump administration tried to do to, to sabotage the Affordable Care Act was to not advertise open enrollment. Well, ironically, even though that advertising was cut 95%, we've had the strongest enrollment ever because people are afraid it's going to go away. Open enrollment's going on now. So if your employer isn't providing insurance for you, you want to go to the website of the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange um, to look and see if you can get a better deal. One final thing on health care, um, the state of Maryland anticipated that something negative would be done to the Affordable Care Act. So there's a commission with members of the House, the Senate, and a variety of other groups that on December 5th will come out with a report to say, here are some things that we can do in Maryland to strengthen our health care offering in anticipation that there are going to be some things taken away from the Affordable Care Act. Uh, you know, I think you'll see maybe we'll continue the mandate, uh, the individual mandate in Maryland, even if the federal one disappears, and there'll probably be about four other recommendations on that. Another major challenge we have to address in Maryland is rural health care. Maybe we don't see it so much in Frederick, but Western Maryland and Eastern Maryland Hospitals are closing, providers are moving out, and many people are well over an hour away from health care. So I think you'll see that a major topic in the next session. And before I sit down, I do want to say one thing about uh, John Delaney, because uh, his effectiveness was questioned in terms of what he does for, uh, for Frederick. Uh, I could go on and give you a laundry list of things, but I'll just give you one thing. When the Trump budget was going to cut out funding from Fort Detrick, he was the first legislator from our state to go fight for it, to ensure that Fort Detrick maintained funding. Why is that important? Single largest employer in Frederick County is Fort Detrick. We lose those jobs and it could severely impact the uh, economic health of Frederick County. So that alone was a major contribution, and that effort was led by John Delaney. Thanks. Thank you.
Just to touch on a little thing in closing. Uh, difference in philosophies and presidents. I think Trump follows the one that if you can't convince people, confuse them. <laughs> and every day we get confused farther with something he says. Uh, just different outlook. Bill Clinton said there's nothing wrong with America that can't be corrected by what's right in America. And uh, Lyndon, go to Lyndon Johnson. We went to see Johnson last night. It's a great movie. You want to go see it? Uh, he said, yesterday is not ours to recover, but tomorrow is theirs to win or lose. And we have to win it. And we have to do the right things, go with the right attitude, go out and vote and put the right people in to do the things we believe in. And we can win tomorrow. I still think as, as bottom as I and as low as I think we've hit, I have a lot of faith in this country. I think it's going to turn around and it's going to get really good again in the future. So anyhow, it's just about four. Really, really appreciate you all coming out with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll probably try to do uh, one of these after session mm -hmm. and uh, probably wait till after election to do another one if I'm still there. <laughs> but I did, as I said, the list is over there. We will be doing Facebook ones. Uh, you can, our office hours are posted over there. If you need to come by and stop for anything. Uh, you can reach us by phone, by email, you know, check the web page. We're on Facebook. Uh, let us know and if we can help in any way. And again, thank you all for coming out. There. And if you're interested in volunteering, that will help Senator Young's office and for whatever it is, happy, uh, support sign up.